Hello everyone, this is Adventures Through the Mind, and I am your host, as always, James Gesso. This podcast is brought to you by my patrons on Patreon, especially the people whose names are written on the screen here or in the description to this episode. Huge thanks to my patrons. Without y'all, I wouldn't be able to continue doing this. Uh, Additionally, there is uh, other financial support that comes to the podcast through purchasing things on my online store, uh, as well as purchasing my books off of uh, Amazon or wherever people buy the books. Uh, so awesome. Thanks to everyone doing that. If you would like to do that, you can head to jameswgesso.com forward slash slash support and see all of those options. That would be great because uh, this show runs on uh, the generosity of uh, patronage rather than on uh, advertising. So big thanks. So jumping in, today's interview is with Ar Thorsten. I hope I pronounced that name right, although I know that I almost definitely didn't. Ar is a veterinarian, an acupuncturist, and a scholar of anthroposophy. He is also recognized as an expert in spirit entities and demonic possession, uh, specifically insofar as their role in illness and uh, in healing from illnesses. Now, you as a listener, if you've been following my work, it might seem sort of oblong that I would have somebody on to talk about demon, demon, demons and spirit possession, because I've been, you know, I've been pretty like, well, let's slow down on the spirit entity mumbo jumbo for the last little while. And I, I remain... Well, you'll see from the interview. The thing is, is that I would never have gone in this direction if it wasn't for a man named Tobias Ton, who was on the show several episodes ago. Um, he uh, focusing on Cambo. I'll put a link in the show notes to this episode so that you can watch that. Um, Tobias and I had been friends for a few years, and uh, you know he was all about this spirit demons thing and i was you know in our conversations be like look man (laughs) i just don't i just don't believe you know but i'm not judging possibly there's something there but i just you know i've had my experiences but i'm just choosing not to i'm just choosing not to put too much cognitive energy into that world because it seems like people go off the deep end with it and i don't want to become one of those people um and anyways so you know it got to a point where i was like you know what this requires some sort of legitimate investigation here somebody like i need to have somebody on the show who represents this in a positive way plus um tobias and i were planning a second interview and he felt that if i were to move forward with the interview which was going to have to do with cambo's ability to cleanse uh, entities and demons and stuff uh you know that i should interview an expert first so tobias put me on to r and now this is a weird episode not because of the content because of the strange reality around it um and as you'll see in this episode see i'm kind of at a loss for words i don't really know what to think here at this point i'm choosing to remain ambivalent which is that I'm choosing to be like, well, you know, all of this stuff may very well be real and I'm going to keep my feet in secularism and not completely denounce it or, you know, claim it otherwise, but certainly not going to jump on the bandwagon. And there has been some interesting stuff that has happened around the recording and the preparing of this podcast that really, you know, from a certain mind state could very much reinforce a tr- like the truth I'm using air quotes for those listening um, as to what R is talking about here and some I mean re-listening to the content some spooky stuff given um, what has ended up happening since this interview um, one of which is that sadly Tobias is no longer with us um, he died last week uh, and I'm gonna make a public announce about that soon because it's very complicated and strange um, and so Anyways, I'm kind of rambling because my my mind is still I'm just I my mind is still grappling with what is happening 
right now um, in the sense of like, you know, well, my friend and colleague died last week and it's, there's just a lot happening in my world right now. So I'm not entirely clear in this intro and I hope that you can forgive me for that. Um, but either way, I'm releasing this episode now rather than who was supposed to come out at this time, which I had mentioned at the ending of the last episode, a psychotherapist um, who had been doing underground psychedelic therapy for a while. I'm releasing it now basically in memory of Tobias because this this interview would not have come out. Um, this would, interview would not have come about if he had not encouraged the connection. And it's a good interview. Like I am, I went from, as you'll see in the beginning, you know, like fairly against it ish to fairly open to it um, because it, you know, it starts to make a lot of sense. Um, now this, the stranger context around this is that the events that, that surround this podcast. Yeah. Maybe I'll talk about that in the outro. For now, enjoy this episode um, dedicated to Tobias Tan, um, episode 102 of Adventures Through the Mind. Everything else seems to be running appropriately. It does. It yeah. does. Yeah, it was. Um, <clears throat> it was interesting for for uh, Tobias to su- to say something along the lines of, you know, that the the entities or the demons try to sabotage. And I had just come out of that call with you. So I was like, oh man, I'm like yeah. kind of on the verge of believing this right now. I don't want to think about it too much. I'll just email Ara <laughs> and hope that he's down for another interview. No problem. You know, I um, I have been um, messed. We have something, I guess maybe you don't have that. It's called poltergeist. Oh yeah, poltergeist. Yeah. Yeah. And they all my life, they have been messing with me. Hmm. And one time they uh, you know things disappear they really disappear in thin air uh, my wife and i we were in uh, in uh, amsterdam mm-hmm. and we had a few hours three four hours to look at the town and we were flying home and then we put the uh, luggage the suitcases into this locker and then out came a ticket with a code mm-hmm. So I took the ticket and I thought, you know, uh, better give it to the woman. She keep this thing. So I gave it to her. And exactly when I gave it to her, I thought she took it. And she thought I took it back. Well, we were in Amsterdam. Then we came back to the locker. And I said, well, uh, do you have the ticket? And she said, no, you have the ticket. After quarreling for five minutes, we went through all our pockets. and. And everything, at least ten times, yeah, <laughs> you know, and no ticket. So we we got hold of a, you know a guard, and we had to prove. And it was we really started to get a little time, and then we got our luggage onto the plane, got home, taxi home. I came home, opened the front door, went into the main room, and in the middle of the table. With the ticket that's weird <laughs> that's a pretty weird and it story. was not i did not was not even touched it was totally without a, r- a wrinkle huh <laughs> so it disappeared in that moment just to make uh, problems for some reason and i have experienced this so many times so i mean this this that story can be a great segue into what we're talking about today um, mm. which you and I are already familiar. We had this conversation. You're obviously familiar with your own work. Um, but the, the listeners um, the listeners might have little to no idea of what it is that we're, we're getting into today. And so yeah. that might be a good segue to introduce um, the topic of spirits, spiritual dimension, um, entities, yeah. and so forth. That's- Why don't you give us a an introductory primer on spirits in the spirit dimension. So generally what your, what your work is all about. You have started now or you mix afterwards. Yes. We're good. We're ready to go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so repeat, I give uh, introduction to what I work with. Yes. 
well, I work with medicine, so um, is that a good introduction? Sure, kind of like an introduction into okay, who I so, am, who who you are. Okay, that's more easy. more like an understanding. I want I want people to get a sense of what it is that we're talking about because we're going to talk about demons, spirits, entities, sh yes, okay. shamans. What what are spirits? What's the spiritual dimension, and how does that involve in your work? Okay. Okay, I, I, I can see a good uh, introduction. <clears throat> okay, good morning, good day. <laughs> my, na my name is Are Thoresen. I'm a veterinarian in Norway. And um, as soon as I started to, to practice, I understood that I had to go deeper, actually, into what disease is, how it is transferred, how, how, what is disease. And then I um, realized very soon that animals had always the same deficiency or same deeper cause for their diseases as their owners, always. And as soon as an owner, let's say this owner had a kidney problem or a kidney weakness when he bought a new dog it very soon got the same problem for example my daughter who is also a veterinarian she was uh, called by from Oslo we live 120 kilometers southwest of Oslo uh, from a man in Oslo who had two um, French bulldogs these small things who was insanely scratching and nothing helped them, not even Cortison. They had been to several veterinarians and to the veterinary school, and so nobody could help. So when I investigated them, I found that both of these small bulldogs had a heart deficiency. And when both had it, I was looking at the owner, and I took his pulse. I used pulse diagnosis. He had also a heart deficiency. Mm. Then I asked him, how long have these uh, bulldogs been scratching? Yes, two years. Okay, then I knew. Okay, two years and one or two months, who left you? And he looked at me with big eyes. My, the love of my life left me. And I was so heartbroken. I have been heartbroken since, and immediately these two dogs started to scratch, 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 scratch. And they got this... This, I call it only this for the time being, cause of the disease from the owner immediately. So when I then, then you, ca you could actually think that this is psychologically. He was sad and the dogs got sad and they had a scratch, eczema. But as soon as then I treated the owner in a few days, the dogs were cured. And this I haven't only seen once, this I've seen every time. All disease in animals come from their owners. So then I wondered more and more, what do they get from the owner? What is it that go from the human to the animal? And as I <clears throat> am born more or less clairvoyant, I very early saw that, you see, in the spiritual world, you have to sort of Look for or know what you look for before you can see it. Not in the physical world. I can look out the window and there is a tree, there is a house. In the spiritual, you have to, okay, is there a house there? Oh, yeah. So I was starting to look and I saw these structures that were in the human body. And these structures um, went from the human into the animal. And, and that I'm writing a book about now, actually just now, that is called Translocation. The first time I saw it was actually, I was only one year in veterinary work after school. And I came home one afternoon and my wife had a, a friend visiting. And I saw this structure halfway out of her head. And I asked, what's the problem? What's your problem? And she said, I have a migraine. 
And I said, can I try to help you? And he said, yes. And I took hold of this structure and pulled it out. Because you see, when you see it, you have a power over it. Mm. It's like fighting with uh, somebody. When you see them, you can <laughs> punch back. If you don't see them, it's not easy. So, and she said, oh, the pain is gone. And then I let it go and it back. And she said, oh, the pain is back. Then I took it out again and threw it out of the window. And then she was healed for years. Hmm. Uh, and then I was quite happy. But then I started a few years later to think, okay, where did that structure go? And you know, somebody else got it. So then I realized more and more that most what we call healings, by acupuncture, zone therapy, homeopathy, whatever, is actually just a translocation of these entities from person to person or from person to animal and so on. I asked a friend of mine, he is a professor in alternative medicine, in, he was in Australia, and he said, uh, did they all Chinese or all cultures know about these things? He said, yes. They knew about it. They wrote about it. For, but for them, it was okay to translocate it because it always go to the weaker. And for old times, that was no problem. Today, we have another moral. And, you know, when they started with slaves and all these things, or the Viking had slaves, or they killed people, it was never questioned that it was unmoral. It was okay hmm. at that time. So to trans form to translocate a disease to a weaker or to an animal was totally okay and it is easy and effective and that is the foundation of the whole so-called five element theory in in eastern philosophy and medicine so if you treat out the five elements you off more or most often translocate the disease you have to change the whole thinking then you can transform it so all these observations through my life with animals i mean thousands at one time i myself treated 10 percent of all horses in norway were on my patient list so i had a huge because it is so effective mm. with this knowledge to treat and um and you know, when you see all this, these structures, you might call it information capsules, or you can call it whatever you want, actually, entities, they were called in old times demons. And I remember also I was sitting in the Pyrenees with a friend of mine. We were visiting the old Qatar places there, and he happened to be an alcoholic. So we sat at the hotel and he had this little bottle, you know, and he took this just like an alcoholic. And immediately I saw a huge, it looked like an individual went into him and he changed his character because that was sort of an entity that wanted to experience the alcohol. And I have seen this many times. Also with drug, for example, I was only 16, 17. I went down to my native town, Sanju, where I still live, and I sat on a bench. And suddenly I started to get hallucinations. I saw colors that was sort of very similar to LSD. And I asked somebody who, who, who sat here before I said, yes, that was a guy who was on um, LSD. So he had left part of this entity that had come in with the LSD and it went over into me. Well, that mm -hmm. was a little introduction to my life and my work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, this last the last part of that makes me think of uh, the old the, out here we have a phrase called contact high. Mm. Um, so something along those lines. Yes. And they're quite interesting because you don't get as high as the first one. Usually. Because this who go over, that is the child of the, you might say, the mother. You have this entity within you, and it sort of um, 
give birth to a smaller a child that go over to somebody else or an animal or a child or a woman or whatever hmm. so um so you've made a you've made a claim here that uh you've made a variety of claims one of the claims yeah. <laughs> you've made is that there is a spiritual dimension um yes. another claim that you made is that that spiritual dimension is occupied by entities or structures or or, or yeah. something spirits uh, spirits um and that disease is is i don't know if you said primarily but i'll make i'll make the claim and, and you can debate it afterwards but disease is primarily caused by interactions of these spirits structures demons entities from the yes. spiritual dimension on the physical psychological body is that, is that yes. all accurate yes very accurate mm -hmm. so then what where is this spirit dimension and, oh, and, and you had to add one thing which is very important especially these days i'm writing about it just now there are two possibilities to sort of treat or deal with these entities one is to translocate it further or one is to transform it and that's very interesting okay great and that come in this five element theory of the east which actually is like better to translocate or a 12 to 7 or 12 element uh, treatment thinking of the west or european or or more yeah that is more to transform these entities mm -hmm. so what then and and that's that's good to know because i asked you a little bit afterwards about what it means to transform them um and what that's like uh but my my initial curiosity here is something akin to you know where is the spirit dimension um because you know like wh where is it like why don't i see it now for example or you know where are these spirits coming from um and how are they how do they come into existence like where are they coming from ultimately so is there what are their cause and what is their location it is actually better to put this question um the other way how did the material dimension come into existence hmm. the material dimension came into existence from the spiritual dimension the spiritual the spiritual dimension sort of crystallized let's say you have a a sea of very very salty water or a lake of very salty water and then you get a little more salt a little more salt then it started to crystallize out and then form worlds and nebulas and milky ways and everything that is sort of crystallized out from the spiritual dimension so it is we are just expressions of the spiritual reality just like you might say if you get embarrassed you get red in your face and then somebody say where did that blood come from it has an expression of a change in your soul hmm. the redness you get red in your face because you got embarrassed you didn't get embarrassed because the blood came to your face so first something happened in the soul the spirit and then it gets a physical expression and that is how actually everything is created yes mm -hmm. so, so that... the spiritual dimension is we it is actually we who are crystallized out of that so it's all over it's everywhere hmm. and in this in in this if you some see the spirits in this uh, for example, in Iceland, 52% of the people believe in the existence of elves. There are people hired by the road uh, makers to look after, so the roads are not uh, disturbing the elves, the spiritual world. And in the north, especially Scandinavia, Iceland, where I live, it is not uncommon to see these spiritual. Uh, creatures. I have written several books about 
that, what I have seen or or uh, interacted with these these spiritual beings. Mm. Well, it's not. Um, it it is it is interesting that it seems most cultures if not all cultures that came before the sort of modern western monoculture of of you know like a ra rationalism um in, in this kind of stuff that they all believed in in these things saw these things i mean believed or knew you know knew, knew yes. it, right so yeah. depending yeah. on how you want to interpret that i'll, I'll still lean towards belief because i'm still on the skeptic side of things but right. i can i can understand your position um no. And I can understand yours because you see, before you actually have seen it, it's just a belief. Hmm. When you have seen it first time, and you know when you see it, there is not just something in your head or some hallucination. You know, it's very, very real. It is when I bought uh, a farm 10 years ago, I bought a farm and I had it for seven years. It was actually 15 years ago now. Um, one of the uh, interesting buyers, when we looked at the farm, was very interested in the wall. He was looking at the wall, really looking at the wall. And I thought it was actually, actually I thought it was a human being who was interesting, interested to buy the farm. But when we bought the farm, he was still there. Hmm. Then I opened the wall where he was very interested. And that was the old door. And I put in the new door there. That was the old door out to the cows, the barn. And then he went out and disappeared. Hmm. Interesting. Yes. See, this is the thing, though, Ara, is that I have seen these things. Yeah. You know, I've, have, I've had these experiences, but I have a hard time, you know, I mean – like I had said to you in the last interview, like having yeah. gone through your work and having had that previous conversation, my mind was really open just, you know, a little bit more than it was previously, which I, I feel like if I'm going to have a, if I'm going to have a, even a skept, a healthy skepticism for something like this, I need to have an open mind enough to understand your argument, to understand your position before I can state that I do or do not buy it. Right. Of course. Um, and so I am a little bit more open now than I was before. And at the same time, even having experienced these things, it's like I I, I still question myself in the sense that it's like, well, yeah. just because I saw that doesn't make it doesn't make it real. And I must tell you, I have been in the exact same uh, position. From I was born, I could see these things, but I doubted them till I was twenty. I thought it was just in my mind. For example, I was playing chess with my father, and every time I saw where the black pond, pond was and where the white pond was, so I could choose exactly what I wanted. And he said, and I didn't want to start with chess, I, I wanted. <laughs> so I got literally 100 times after each other the black, and he said, how can that be? And I saw it, but I thought, so obviously I saw it, but I thought it was in my head. And when I was 20, a doctor told me, you know, it's not normal to see through the hands. And then, oh, yes, it came like this. Mm. It is. It is not just in my head. And then it started to also develop further because as long as I doubted it and thought it was just in my mind because I was sort of intellectual atheist, uh, I didn't actually believe in these things. So then when I sort of realized it was a reality, then it started to develop. But you have sort of to embrace it first. Hmm. Then you will see uh, it's like love. Yeah, I feel the attraction to this woman or that woman, you know, but uh, I don't believe in love. No. <laughs> but if you really open yourself hard to it, then you really can experience it hmm. for real. It's yeah. very like that. Well, I, I, I mean, I still like I, I maybe I'm trying to do intellectual gymnastics here to make sense of it because I have the experience and, and even reading um, your book on demons, you know, I had said to you in the last the, the last interview that, you know, I, I was going through two battles, right? One battle was um, fighting against the urge to just chalk it all up as a bunch of bullshit. And the other battle was fighting against an urge to, 
to believe it because it made sense. Mm. And so I was in this weird position. So I started talking to people and um, people that I know, people that I trust about the ideas. And I was amazed at how many people had experiences and how many people who are in healing professions or in, you know, like psychedelic related things, not only like had these experiences, but either low key or explicitly believed in them and that their belief in them and interaction with them proved to get effective results in hmm. their in their in their cases and i've i've had friends that have been in the psychedelic scene and eventually get into this and i'm like you're just going psychotic you're letting the hallucinations change your view of reality and yet these people and yourself seem to get very real effective results in treatment protocols interacting with this Mm. this this reality of engagement mm. and there i must add uh, let's say in the in the scene of the drugs let's say in psychi psychiatry you see if you meet an entity or a demon or whatever and you don't believe in it then you really get psychotic mm. or disturbed not necessarily psychotic or but disturbed at least but if you believe in it and if you have some knowledge about it, then you can actually deal with it very easily. Hmm. You can take it away. You can stop it. You can say, go back. You don't do that to sort of a, what you think is a bad trip. <laughs> mm -hmm. And like, as I, as I, as I go through the process, it's like, I, I can make sense of, okay, so I can make sense of everything is energy, um, which I mean, I say that very generally and hope that people don't take that as too woo -woo of a statement, but everything is energy and that we as humans have, you know, a greater perceptual capacity than what is, you know, given to us raised inside of the modern industrial world insofar as being able to intuit and interact with the natural energies of the planet. Um, and that these energies could manifest in a variety of ways internally and subjectively in the form of, um, you know, uh, in, in the form of, of like uh, elves or fairies or what have you, anomalous energy patterns that emerge mm. out of the, the complexity of the biosphere in a, in, a, in a forest or in a mountainscape or what have you, that they can emerge this way and, and these energy patterns can be understood subjectively as a spirit or an elf or something. But then in my mind, I still resist saying it's an elf, you know, like it's just energy. I'm just interacting with this energy. And that's like in my mind, that's the way that I can, I can rest into being like, okay, I could believe it a little bit as long as I just recognize that there's, this is me subjectively constructing metaphors to interact with what is ultimately just energy patterns. That is actually the most common misunderstanding hmm. within your field. That is, you see, the spiritual world is not energy. Energy is still in the physical world. In the brain, for example, it is energy. The synapses, energy. The hallucinations is energetic. Uh, you can put on electricity, you know, electromagnetism, all this is energy. But in the spirit, that is not energy. It is really not physical. Hmm. Electromagnetism is still physical. And if you, and in that field, you can explain everything like synapses or or endorphins or whatever you want but in the spiritual that is a total different realm you might say that uh, if I and, and that is very important and I will like try to make um, um, uh, sort of parallel in the to what we all know uh, today we discuss the difference between Sex and love, for example. Sex is definitely hormones, this drive. Definitely. And that is physical. But love, that is something t completely different. That is spiritual. 
not hormonal mm. or blood uh, into the face or wherever you know all that that is sexual and so you see there is it and that first the sexual sexuality is energy and the other is not energy it is spiritual that is for me quite important and when i understood that were two different things because i for years also explained it the way you do energy patterns and interference and, and all these things is not and if you look at it then it doesn't evolve the spirituality doesn't evolve if you look at it as an energy hmm. just a comment hmm. um so before we move forward there's like a weird sound in your environment like a yeah liz can you liz yeah okay everybody's hearing you right <laughs> thanks So it is the paper knittering. Okay. Now okay. it's quiet. Okay, great. Thank you. Um Okay, like I I am I I'm still I'm still struggling, but I'm with you here. Um and I'm wondering instead of just continuing right now to unpack my own my own doubts and reservations, I want to ask you a little bit more um sp specific. Okay. So um Essentially, you suggest in your book, or you say in your book, uh, Demons, that um, these spirits are made, and they're made by things that we can point to in the physical world, forests, mountains, or, or maybe biospheres. They're also made inside of the human body. Can you talk about those two things? One, how they're made. Um, be it in the human or in the larger environment, um, and whether or not these are sentient intelligences. Hmm. Well, um, as the whole world and what we know as everything, cosmos, was sort of crystallizing out of the spiritual, there were a lot of spiritual entities millions, billions of entities. These entities are either beneficial or uh, sort of backstanding entities. Uh, those who have with us to do is sort of made from our actions. Uh, this is uh, how I came to these insights. It's actually a very long story, but I will make it very short. Uh, my teacher in acupuncture, uh, a Hungarian doctor, he was asked by the prison authorities in Oslo to help the prisoners sleep better. And he looked at where they were sleeping, and there were quite much earth radiation there. So he changed uh, beds to another place, and they all slept better. But after a month, he went back, and then the earth radiation had moved after the prisoners. Mm -hmm. And that I've seen, that makes a very good uh, answer to quite many people work with sort of isolating houses or keeping you away from earth radiation or whatever. And they have to change it all the time. It doesn't last because it is changing and this earth radiation i started to see that was quite early and they are the same entities they are created by human actions and they belong to the persons there is an old norwegian song that uh, the farmer wanted to move away from his this uh, earth radiation this karma is uh, his uh, creatures, but they followed him. It was no use to move away because I was sitting at the top of the horse and say, we are moving together today, you and I. Um, so I realized the only way to actually eliminate these creatures was to realize how they were made. I was at in America. I visited the northern part of New York State, 
And there was a place where there were quite many horses who had much pain in their body, much pain in their body. And nothing could really heal them. And I saw immediately that this was a huge entity there that had to do with an Indian massacre. Mm. So, and there were about 20 veterinarians with me, and we all, horse veterinarians, we uh, looked at the horses and the pain here and there and so on. And then I said, let us do something else. Let us stand in the middle of this entity and ask for forgiveness for what was done to the Indians. Because this was an old camp site of the Indians where they were massacred. And we did add in within 10 minutes or 15 minutes, the pain started to loosen in the horses, all the horses. Some faster, some not so fast. It was amazing. So you see, this old deed, what they did in America, and that is why there are actually quite much painful conditions in at least the East Coast, that is what I know. You know, first you had the massacres of the Indians, then you had the treatment of the slaves, then you had the civil war. Mm -hmm. There are so much pain. I traveled the Blue Ridge Highway uh, last year. It took me one week. One, yeah, one week. Uh, you know that, yeah, Blue Ridge, mm -hmm. yeah. And it was so much pain, and so many demons, and so many lost souls. You know that because of all this, at one area they were screaming out like. From the from the Indian side, then more south, it was more from the slave. I came to Savannah, where it was oh, crying, and all this makes makes actually disease that make all these actions make demons or spiritual entities that is not uh, working well with the humans that is more like future spirits like influencing all the horses or parts of the city or these blocks in savannah and so on and you have then also smaller you have smaller spiritual beings you might say smaller demons that is more personal from what you have done for example, that man with uh, who uh, was crushed by this broken love two years before, and these dogs got this problem. These demons related only to this tree, this man and the two dogs. And when this was released, I would say transformed, not translocated, because I'm more and more cautious about not treating in a way that just translocate disease but transform it from it then this demon was sort of transformed and the much of this transformation is to understand why this demon was created when you understand why it is usually transformed and that is in all old norwegian stories these forces are considered as trolls or huldur or dwarves, gnomes, and so on, especially trolls. And everybody knows in Norway, when the sun shines on the troll, it is killed. And by that is said, when you're with your consciousness, see what it is, then it has no power over you anymore. And that is also what I told you, this uh, woman with this structure in the head, when I saw it, I had the power. Hmm. As long as you don't see it, they have the power. Then it is like you go in a dark night and there are a lot of tigers or lions around. You know, they you have the chance. But as long as you it's day, you can see them. You can actually climb a tree or whatever, shoot or, yeah, whatever. <laughs> you can actually run away. Mm -hmm. Or, or fight them in a total other way than if you don't see them. And you don't see them because you don't believe in them. And that is a sort of uh, enigma, it's a problem, because <laughs> you don't 
feel you don't believe in them before you see them, and you don't see them before you believe in them. You have sort of to say, okay, I open myself to it. And it's not physical, it's definitely spiritual, it's not energetic. And then suddenly you can see it. And I have also teaching groups how to see it because you can do certain techniques also to see these uh, these entities. Hmm. So then I, I've got I've got th- three questions right away that I want to uh, that I want to explore, and I'll, I'll tell them to you now so you can help me remember them as we go through. But I'll ask you them one by one, which is about um, you know phys- physical agents of illness, and then um, what does it mean to transform them. Uh, like what is that process and then we'll, I'll ask you about seeing them before we get into some of the more explicitly psychedelic stuff so the first question is okay so spirits uh, demons cause disease and I, I can you know I can really I can really get on board with the idea that um, or the observation that trauma stays in the land um, and that tragedy hangs around and can then influence people when they're in those in those spaces. I, I can really get on board with that, um, and that how our actions can contribute to certain patterns, behaviors, even illnesses um, that that manifest in the body, and that they have an origin in something that's you know non physical in the sense that it was inspired by an internal. Um, like you use the word soul, but sort of like a, an internal, non-physical action, a decision, a, a, an emotional impulse or whatever. So I can get on board with that too. Um, and that these things can lead to disease. Now, what about, I mean, bacterias, viruses? I mean, what about, I mean, are these, these aren't, these aren't spirits. These aren't demons. Yes. These are, yes. oh, you're yes, saying, they, th- they are. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Can you can you can you substantiate that for us? Like, to, uh, explain it. Explain it to me. I can um, give you an example because uh, my father, he was very very worried when I was small, because my his first child died and I was then the second. So every time I had a fever, I got a huge injection of penicillin. <laughs> very nice. So that destroyed my digestion for. 40 years, mm. 50 years. Yeah. I got a fungal infection. And then I tried to get rid of this fungal infection with different means, different means. But it never worked. It was a little better, it came back, and so on and so on. And then I started to realize that why are they there? Because they are expressions of something. They are physical expressions of uh what you call energy or a spiritual entity. And when I started to work a little, to understand what is this? Why are you there? And then I was sitting at the top deck of a bus in London once. (laughs) And then I sort of got a grasp on this spiritual dimension in bacteria because I'm educated in bacteriology. I was actually intended to be the North Norwegian specialist in fish bacteriology. I have studied that for many years. So for me, it was a little difficult to grasp this, okay, bacteriology and spirituality. But then I saw this structure went out of my stomach and disappear. That was a translocation of the transformation. And from that moment, this, the problem was gone. The problem was totally gone. And you might say, we have all in our body, we have all different kinds of bacteria or virus or fungus, or we all have millions, you know, but they are in the balance. But if one, and they are sort of in our balance within our spirituality, but if, uh, you might say, uh, fungus, spirit come in then this fungus spirit sort of help its ser- servants the small ones mm. and as long as this spirit is there nothing can get them away and they thrive and get many 
it's like in a society, let's say in a, in a primitive society, there are many uh, tribes. And if the president, you can see that sometimes from Africa, the Hutu and the Tutsi problem. If the president is a Hutu, then all the Hutus will get the good jobs and the Tutsis will be suppressed. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And sort of if this fungal spirit have opportunity to slip into my body as it did during my early childhood, then I can never get rid of them. I can suppress them and eat this or that for a long time, you know, like some do with acne, they eat tetracyclines for years and not get rid of the the spirit actually that causes it. But I saw it disappear. I saw it and I was cured. Hmm. So then I thought, wow, for me, you know, uh, I also have that this development because I was, uh, I studied both veterinary medicine and human medicine and bacteriology quite much and also um, agriculture. Uh, so it's, it was difficult for me to really grasp that into the smallest part, it is governed by spirits. Hmm. So then, so then the cold, flu, Ebola, measles, these are spirits. And in the same way that they off, uh, off babies on yeah. others, that's what they we express, call contagious diseases. Right. They materialize in bacteria, in viruses. Hmm. Just like a bird is also a materialize. As I said in the beginning, the whole cosmos is a materialization of the spirit. So, of course, diseases are, and the bacteria are, and so on. So Ebola is like a crystalline manifestation of a demonic entity in the spirit realm. Yes. <laughs> Sounds really cool. Um, interesting. And so I, I had asked this earlier, but I, I think that um, I'm not sure if you answered it. And so I'll just ask it outright. Like, are these are these intelligent entities? Or are they... I've been reading Orson Scott Card recently in the Ender's Game series, and he he has this like this degree of other, and one of them is like, Ramen, which means like they're like us. I can interact with you. You can interact with me, mm. right? Like if if you were a different species and we could interact this way, we would say that you're ramen. But if if you're not, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right because I've only read it, which is like varalis. If you're essentially like I can't communicate with you, you're an animal or you're an animal with no self reflective awareness, you know, impulsive, instinctive, or whatever. That you would no longer be ramen. You're Varalis or something. So, are these like, are these entities? Are they ramen? Are they intelligent? Do they I make read, intelligent I choices? Read, I haven't read that book, so well, I don't know. <laughs> well, but but I mean, I'm just making the reference for my own thing. I'll just ask it yes, explicitly. Do they do they have do they have intelligence in the way that we have intelligence? Do they make choices? Um, is it self reflexive, or is this just like impulsive? The way the wind the wind blows because hot air rises and cold air rushes in to take its place. It's not a choice. It's just and, what happens. And now you ask me to define uh, intelligence. <laughs> Go you for know, it. <laughs> you know what? When the beaver, when the beaver make the dam, is highly intelligent. Mm-hmm. An engineer couldn't do it better. When the bees make the hive, they are highly intelligent. We couldn't do that. And the wasp made paper, or when the uh, bat fly in the night, you know, just by listening, that is highly intelligent. So yes, these entities are highly intelligent, highly, far above us. But they have no moral. You know, a bee has no moral. If you touch it, it stings you. It's, <laughs> that's just a reflection. And they, they don't have moral. Like we, is this right or is this wrong? And I did that and I stole that, you know, and I, I regret it for two years and I pay it back. And so they don't have moral. And that's why also not this self-reflection because that is specifically human. Hmm. So these spirits or entities, they are highly intelligent, highly powerful, non-moral, non-I conscious or self-reflecting beings. That is my answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really on board with you about the intelligence thing there. Um, So yeah, right on. 
Um, now let's get into this eye consciousness thing. Um, I think that was that was the second question. Was uh, was how what does this transformation look like? What is yes? And I know that the concept of eye consciousness comes into this. Yeah, and this is a very very uh, central part of the whole demonology, and actually the I experienced this first time when I was my maybe six years old. I had a very severe cold, you know, winter in Norway, and I had a sore throat. And then I experimented by putting my eye consciousness into the throat. As I told you, I've been actually clairvoyant my whole life, so I had these thoughts even from that age. And in a few minutes, I was cured by the cold. I cannot say I can do that today, but that was the first time. And it was amazing. And I seen later, uh, when you have an eye consciousness, you are sort of unattackable. Quite interesting, in schools, I have talked with several schools of acupuncture or food zone therapy and like that. Qigong even, Tai Chi, uh, when they treat, they are instructed how to defend themselves. But they never ask how to defend others or the neighbor or the spouse when they get home. But this to defend oneself from these entities is to be conscious, to be aware that you are you. I am I. I am aware of my integrity sort of dignity i am a spiritual being and if you are aware of that then you are sort of unattackable if you for one second loses that consciousness then you might actually get the spirit inside you i have experienced that myself many have like you said you have talked to colleagues i have talked to many colleagues too of mine and they all know that as soon as you relax in the eye consciousness, you get, can, then you are an opening for these spirits. Then you can get the disease in one second. Mm. And then you have to treat yourself. That is actually common knowledge in, in schools of acupuncture and zone therapy. Um, so this is the eye consciousness. And if you can move your eye consciousness, yeah, first, it is almost like the theory of relativity. You have the special, uh, general uh, theory of relativity and special uh, theory of relativity. If you can have the eye consciousness generally within yourself, then you are uh, sort of, you, you keep these spirits away. You are not attacked. But then you can move to the general theory of relativity you can have your eye consciousness in my hand for example if you see this uh, on i never seen it by real life but you have this asian they put three or four bricks on each other and they just mm -hmm. and everything uh, they can do things that seems impossible you can do that i can also have tried that a few times when you put my eye consciousness in my hand i can have that effect mm -hmm. i tried it once i was playing tennis with a friend of mine we had been playing for several years and then i think i would try this method so we were playing ordinary i was hitting and i gave him a very ordinary ball and then i put the eye consciousness in my hand my will in my hand the ball came back and i hit it normally back to him just normal and then he stopped he stopped he looked at me with big eyes and said, w -w 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 what did you do now? Well, I put my eye conscious will in my hand. And he said, if you do that once more, I will never play with you again. Because it was like a cannonball coming back. Mm -hmm. So this gives you this strength. And this strength of the eye consciousness is actually only humans who have. Animals don't have it. If you can make this eye consciousness in in your, uh, if you can make the eye consciousness conscious, 
then you can do what uh, is demonstrated in the crocodile dundee. Then you can just say, and the dog just lie down. Mm. And the demons lie down. <laughs> so what is this eye consciousness? What, what does it feel like? Like, how would I know that I'm that I'm in, I'm, I'm in my eye consciousness. Like, how do I differentiate that between? If you haven't been, you had been psychotic because then you would have been attacked by all these things. As long as you are aware, I am I. I am, and your name is Christoph. Now, what is James, your name? James. James, yeah. yeah. That's what, I am James then you are in your eye consciousness. You see, an animal cannot say, I am James. Or a lion cannot say, I am Frank. They are just a group. So they don't have this I consciousness, because I, it is only one person in the whole world who can say I to you, and that is you. Mm. I cannot say I to you, I say you. You can say I, and as long as you feel as an I, then you have the I consciousness. Is there a, like a, a specific somatic, like a, is there a, is there a quality of sensation that you could, that, that you could point to in the body or that I could watch for? Um, like, I, I'm just trying to get a sense of like, trying to get a triangulate myself inside of what does it feel like if i just say that i could if i just say i am james you know that's like really like i'm saying that up here but what if i'm just saying that up here i'm not in my body i'm not like what yeah. is what is it like to be fully if, if i'm feeling it physically what is it like to be in eye consciousness yes that is a, a an, an um, training actually you have to train to be in your body and not only up here. Uh, you must say these, these legs, they are mine. I am here. I am here. I am in my body. If you don't say that, if you just stay up here, you know what that led to. You can look through history and wonder how could these people do these things like in torture chambers or in the war or whatever that is because they split off or in rape or sexual abuse it was not so not actually i it was my penis who did it or it was my gun who did it or not i or the trauma it was the trauma from my generation's past that did it or whatever yeah. yeah you have to be conscious about that that is a long training of course this eye consciousness wakes up in the child around three years of age. And suddenly they realize, I am me. And to strengthen that eye consciousness, that is to strengthen your powers. And the next, as I said, the general <laughs> theory of relativity, the general theory of eye consciousness, if you put it in your hands or if you put it in your legs or if you put it in your fingers or if you put it in your out actually here and then you that is how i observe clear one clairvoyantly i put my eye consciousness out and that in if you have read the books of carlos castaneda no mm -hmm. oh you have i've read i've read the teachings of don juan i didn't continue yes. on from there and he called it the assemblance point. Assemblance point. That is the eye consciousness. And if you change the, his uh, Don Juan said that if you change your assemblance point, out in the shoulder or out in the arm or wherever or out of the body, then you come in totally different realities. If you remember. I do remember. I, I kind of have yeah. my reservations against Carlos Castaneda because of me the, too. You know him but being ultimately a charlatan and a liar I in know. many ways. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. But yeah. he explained it very well in that moment, mm. and that I have experimented with myself to put your eye consciousness. I can put my eye consciousness into other persons. I can put my eye consciousness in my fingers. I can put it 
elsewhere. But that is long training. Mm -hmm. And then I can do certain things there. And these certain things are things that you would do to um, facilitate healing, to transform or to trans to transform spirits. Is that you would use the eye consciousness, put it into whatever, and do something? No, I will not do that because that is considered black magic. Hmm. And that was like the shamans often do black magic. You shall not go into anybody without their allowance. You can do it if they say, okay, do that. But I, I don't do that in when I treat. I do only I activate the forces within the, own, the body or connection to the spiritual and then let them work with that. So that is something else. Hmm. So you're like support their eye consciousness. Yes. Interesting. Um, so... Uh, unless unless I'm derailing you from something else you you felt like you needed to say on that, I want to ask another question. Okay, go ahead. Um, how how do we see these things? Is there something that you could offer me, the listeners here, as sort of like a yes. try this first kind of yes. way of seeing these yes. these spirits? I have that, and I am teaching this actually in several places in the world. And that was my first experience in life, was that my thinking left me and went outside my body. And I fought it for years, 10 years. And then I sort of started to understand it. But that is actually very simple method of clairvoyant observation, all these entities. And the closest thing is the, and now I will describe the situation. You sit in a very boring lecture at the university mm -hmm. or high school or whatever. Very boring on neuroscience or <laughs> something like that it's funny that's the opposite of boring for me but i hear what you're saying <laughs> yeah i i mean yeah i i just example sure i've been yeah. i've been studying and that was the least interesting actually or chemistry you might say or whatever and then and the teacher go on with the third degree of synapses and the bra 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 and all the transmitters and then at a certain point, you fade out. You are a little tired. You are a little hungry. You are a little fed up of it. You are not really interested. Or you might have a situation, you are in town and you meet an old friend you haven't seen for 20 years. And you actually are hungry and tired and cold and want to get home. That happened to me once. And this friend started to talk about his children and show pictures of, you know, very, very interesting. <laughs> and you try to be honest and then you suddenly fade out behind. You sort of fade out into eternity. Hmm. And the hearing is a little dimmed. You, it is a little, you don't hear exactly. And you say, yes, yeah. You don't actually hear what you say just halfway. And in this situation, you have to sort of develop that same fading away with your thinking. The, the thinking leaves you sort of behind in the periphery. And then you have to fill this thinking with your eye consciousness. That is a little tricky. Because if it just leaves you, you see nothing. Then you are sort of just left there a little dumb, mm. just standing there unable to, where am I? So what sort of... <laughs> a little little dumb but if you then follow this thinking with your consciousness eye consciousness then suddenly through this extended thinking you start to see movement especially on the right side that's almost always on the right side i see that first hmm. you see certain movement and it gets a little dark and this is the beginning and then when you have looked at this for several days 
this movement starts to get more and more distinct and you see it very more clearly and in a year or two it really is you see that it is actually entities and after five ten years you can start to sort of communicate even with them so let's that is one that is one method yeah that that's, i have used that's great and i like it, as as vague as that might seem it also sounded very clear um, in the sense that it's like I understood in my mind how I could, how I could guide myself to at least try that. You know, yeah. whether or not it's real, that that doesn't matter. Point is, I could try what you just offered there and experiment for myself what the what the results are. So I appreciate you sharing that with me and with us. Yeah. Um, before we before we draw this to a close, this is running. Um, little over an hour and I I think it's really great so I would love if, if you could stick around for a little bit longer we could keep talking be all right for you yes great um, I'd like to get specifically into where psychedelics sit inside of this understanding of reality yes. um, you and, and shamanism as well because you propose that psychedelic plants um, open uh, like a gateway where you can see the spirit realm but then the spirits can also get into you can you just tell us a little bit more about that yes and i have experienced that and i have seen it and i have been in as in norway you know you have a shamanistic culture still and uh, so what i now say is actually self experiences self experienced um so when this going out with the thinking or you can also go out with the feeling or with the willing but i just described the thinking but you can go out with all these soul properties and that resembles actually when you think about it when you have taken a so plant or a drug you sort of disappear a little that is quite common. You sort of disappear. You, you, you go out. And this is actually quite equivalent. You use an, a drug instead of the mind to go out. And that gives the possibility, then you have sort of divided the thinking or the feeling or the willing. That is the foundation of all spiritual uh, observations then you sort of look into the spiritual and that is through this opening all this gateway or passage or portal and then you see if you do it by thought by will or conscious then you have full control over this gateway so and that is the problem might uh, be the problem uh, i might say with drugs if you don't follow it by your eye consciousness then you have a two-way um, uh, traveling in this portal two-way uh, passage either you can go out and watch in the spiritual world you can even do things there but that is difficult without your strong eye consciousness or you can be invaded by different spirits, which might be called a bad trip, or you get exhausted, or whatever you might call it. So that this then is a two-way uh, passage. And my concern is that some drugs sort of weaken the eye. Mm -hmm. You can see it in long-term use. You don't get done thing you don't clean the apartment well enough you let things the clothes not being well and so on that is a weakening of the eye sort of the body the consciousness of being you and this makes the access to alien spiritual impulses and the, quite interesting the different drugs open to very different parts of the spiritual world because in the spiritual world it's not just one big room it is actually very leveled very compartmented and then you can get into spheres of 
or more demons or angels for that matter or or uh, aliens you can experience this as aliens or, or yeah and so on hmm. interesting so so you're suggesting or you're saying here that that if we lose the eye consciousness while tripping psychedelics we'll stay on psychedelics i can understand how certain other drugs even psychedelics depending on how they're used can weaken the the eye consciousness i don't know if that really needs to be explained it seems very um, obvious obvious yeah. right um, yes. specifically with the psychedelic plants psychedelic substances that can be utilized in a shamanic type nature what you're saying yeah. is that as long as we hang on or hold that eye consciousness like a coherent sense of being as we travel these realms, we're unlikely to um, accidentally, uh, you know, incarnate a, a, a demonic entity in our being. Like we're we're unlikely to bring in spirits that we didn't choose. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Or so, impulses, or impulses. It doesn't have to be one hundred percent demonic. There are you have all levels of it. So some sort of influence that actually you don't want. Mm -hmm. Well, I can definitely see that in 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 just like totally non spiritual language. I could say that if you take too much and lose and lose coherency, you can enter into a dissociative state, and in that dissociative state, you may end up interacting with you know, a psych, a, like a full psychotic break, which causes hmm. you to behave in a way that can cause a lot of issues. Like for example, um, I just finished listening to a podcast from a guy named James Kent, who would basically chalk you up to being a schizophrenic. Actually, he, I, I imagine he would, he would say that what you're talking about is, is total horseshit, but he was talking about uh, people, a case of a guy getting stuck really high on mushrooms and becoming convinced that his friend was incarnated by the devil and the only way he could stop it is to murder his friend cut out his heart and cook that heart in the oven um and so i could see it's like even if i were to take a totally non-spiritual route if you go so far that you completely lose sense of yourself and of reality then the consequences of that can be you know not certainly not often that dramatic but no, quite but traumatic still, in, yeah. in a negative in a negative state and very interesting twice you have now said dissociative mm -hmm. and lose yourself because mm -hmm. that is exactly what happens as long as you dissociate your eye consciousness or lose yourself which is the same then that is the danger but if you keep that and the interesting thing i have you can have far more interesting experience than by going out with your eye consciousness instead of opening this portal with a plant. It can be a help maybe in the beginning, but then you have to do it yourself. And you have to then accept or believe it is possible to do it. I can... I can... Um, I tell you one experience I had. I was invited to my friend on New Year's Eve. The day before, I sort of got the conviction, the calling, whatever, just very conscious. I have to go to the Atlas Mountains. That is in Northern Africa. So I jumped on a plane from Norway to Marrakesh, hired the car, went up in the mountains, New Year's Eve, I spent the night in a cold hotel. It has been closed for the winter. <laughs> it was snow further, two pillows. And then I woke up in the morning, I went out, and then suddenly I really up in those mountains, I could go out with my eye consciousness in a way that I never could before. I could penetrate the whole earth. I could see the... Uh, the silver mines, the gold, the iron, I could really see all this. And it was an extremely interesting experience, which I knew was real because I was there with my eye consciousness. It was not just some hallucination thing. But if I had seen all that 
on a drug, it wouldn't have been so sort of whole. Mm. It, it is very different because I have also tried many different drugs. Um, and, and that is so, it is like sitting on the back on a motorbike instead of sitting in the front and driving or you know, whatever I should say. Mm. So now I got another question I wasn't planning on asking. I mean, are you like in hearing that, you know, I wonder about the, the, the argument for continuing to work with plants um, by calling their spirits your allies. So the spirit of the mushroom is my ally. Yes, they're, they're riding the bike, but in, in a way, like I'm asking them to ride the bike that way I could do something else that otherwise I wouldn't be able to do if I was the one, you know, controlling mm -hmm. the steering. So, um, how do you feel about, how do you feel about that? Or, or are you sort of set in saying that like the apex of engaging with the spiritual realm is to do it without, without agents? Is that, yes. is that, hmm. you can use one to see some one time maybe, or you, maybe you don't even have to do that. but. If you continue to be on the back of the bike, for example, I had this very interesting also incident uh, <laughs> with this frog toxin. Mm -hmm. uh, I was. Uh, was it Cambo? The one that no. gets burned into your arm? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. And I actually intended to do that. And. The day before, I had the most extraordinary experience. I was walking in the forest, and I had been walking there many times. Suddenly, I fell down into a hole, and I stood in here with dirt, you know, uh, uh, mushy, uh, like a bog. Mm. And at that moment, this frog spirit came and said, you are not supposed to do that. You can do it yourself. And I, I was afraid. I jumped up, you know. I was uh, thought, what if I'm sucked down? This is a bog sort of. Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I jumped up and then I, uh, I smelled, you know, very bad. And I went home and washed. And I told this man who was doing this um, frog ceremony, I'm not to do it, the frog. Spirit came to me and told me, I should do it myself. Because they also want that the plant spirits, the frog spirits, whatever spirit, they want us to do it ourselves. Because then we go in, come into another uh, interesting realm of this, which I don't know if should, we should go into, but um, I, I will do it actually the same. There is a Norwegian poet from the 18, very early 1900 who said that the whole of nature, the salvation of all the animals, is by humans gaining their eye consciousness in a way that they can encompass the whole creation. Huh. And the whole creation long for humans to do that. So you see the plants, they want to help us a little, but then we should take over ourselves. And this frog toxin, um, the frog saw that I didn't need that help. That reminds me of one of my first jobs that was a doctor and she was clairvoyant. And that was in 1972. And Everybody was then interviewed when they started this job, and uh, they want also they didn't want drug addicts. So one question is always, do you use drugs? This was in a home for uh, mentally handicapped. So she asked me, do you use drugs? And then she said, no, don't answer. I can see that you don't because you are on drugs all the time. Because I was already a certain clairvoyant so mm -hmm. my sort of spirit was sort of free and that is the same that the drugs do but they don't do it with the eye consciousness 
And if you have high consciousness enough, then you don't have to do it. Mm. So, so uh, it's uh, an interesting schizma uh, when you come to that point. Yeah. Mm. For myself, I'm still I'm still fully interested and invested in riding on the back of the bike uh, for the time being. Um, uh, but I, I I do I do appreciate where you're where you're coming from. I want to ask these like last sort of three questions, two of which are specific to this topic. The third um, is sort of going to be a general closing question. Uh, earlier, you mentioned about how when you lose uh, eye consciousness, then you open yourself up to say possession of of things that can be damaging and and so on and so forth. Um, and yet, uh, the research in like the scientific research right now going into utilizing psilocybin uh, for, um, for the treatment of treatment resistant depression, other issues, as well as some of the stuff that's coming up around 5-MeO-DMT uh, and other psychedelics is suggesting that the most profound healing experience is when the the baseline the waking state ego which i i think most people and even myself would right away assume like i am is an ego statement that when that goes away and we enter into what they call a mystical type experience that this is where a lot of the positive benefits are coming from. And if you hear people talking about the toad, 5-MeO-DMT, they say that the healing is when who you think you are is gone. There's no time, there's no space, there's no nothing, there's just everything, and I am everything, and so, and, and God is. There isn't even a reference of I, just God is. Mm. And so I'm... I'm curious where that falls into play because to some degree that is dissociation, at least from the normal sense of identity that I carry. Yes. Is, and yet there's a positive benefit. Yes. And I'm very aware of what you say. <laughs> and I've been thinking about that for years. Um, you see, I said the I consciousness, and that has to do with the spirit. Then you have the soul, which is the feeling, the thinking, the feeling, thinking, willing, soul. Not the spiritual consciousness, but the soul. And in the soul, you have uh, the sort of mental diseases. That is in the soul. And you can dissociate with the soul. And then experience a healing of the soul soul hmm. but without the i and that is often done with what you mentioned so you know that is what they in old times called nirvana you reach a sort of nirvanic state you see the wholeness of everything and you feel this peace and you are at peace but that leaves out actually the, the development of the i consciousness and that is the new thing. That is the old thing was the nirvanic. That has to do with the kundalini force that goes up through the spine. And then you have the eye consciousness who go down actually in the front. This, but now we come into details, maybe too much. Mm. But they are two different streams. And this old stream is a healing of the soul and that is not what creation look for they look for a strengthening of the eye and the healing of the soul through the eye and not the direct healing of the soul i have written a book on hexagonal structures which is very often in the uh, these um, these substances you know the hexagon mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah like in, in, the, in the molecule you mean yes yeah and i could send that to you there i go actually very deeply into what they actually do in the soul and you can see that in nature you can see it in the hexagons you can see it in the substances you can see it in the insects you can see the eyes of the insects all these hexagonal structures 
they relate very much to the soul properties and can heal the soul. But not the I. And for me, that is very important. Mm. Uh, I think that that takes a long time to really understand the difference between the I consciousness, really understand that, and a balanced soul or healing through the eye or healing directly through the soul. You see, this healing can be very nice and get the soul in balance and see the connection to the whole cosmos. And you can very well feel, experience, and see that without the eye. That is the benefit of the substances, the plants, the, the drugs, actually. But that is not through the eye. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can understand um, that as uh, like I, as a uh, it could have explanatory value to understand how people can have this. Mm. I am. I am that I am. Connection mm. is God is love is I am experience, um, and then within a few weeks afterwards just be totally back to being a piece of shit person in the world mm. um and then then there's all the important talk right now about integration and, and the value of that which seems like trying to then reshape the eye around mm. the experience of the soul um it, mm. to, to use your language there um mm. but unless you want to comment uh, any further on that i have um i want to move on to the second last question all right. Yeah, I think I yeah <clears throat> I I could try again and again to define what is the I consciousness uh, apart from the the uh, soul balance or so. What is the spirit in difference from the soul? Uh, but I think I leave it by what I've said. Great. Yeah. I mean, there's a there's a lot to there chew on there for the listeners. Mm. Um, so. All right, so psychedelics open a gateway, um, yes. and it can open us up to you know being possessed by demons. Um, yes, but they or half, de or half demons <laughs> or quarter demons. Okay, so things that are you know but either by alien alien forces, right? Not, that is not really you. Okay, okay. Yeah. Now we could also interact with benevolent spirits, can we not? Like, yes. So. This is sort of like a like a two part question. Um, one of which is how to tell the difference between a benevolent spirit and a non like a, a malevolent spirit, or even some something that's you know closer to the range of negative. Um, and is it advantageous for us to welcome in benevolent spirits? Yeah, and that goes to the same. You see, <clears throat> the benevolent spirits. They, of course, can go into his, us and take charge or help us for a while. A good, but still, that is not through our eye. We don't actually develop. For example, uh, Joan of Arc. France had to be rescued from the English. A benevolence, angelic spirit took possession of her and she led the whole army you know it's incredible what she did mm. and she was aware it was in her spiritual guidance she did all that but that actually didn't save her eye because she was a she was under the she was an instrument sort of okay it was right it was good and the benevolent spirits can help us but there is a law in the spiritual world, which is very interesting. And that is, the, it is not legal to interfere with the free will of a human being. It is not legal. So, and the benevolent spirits have to follow that rule. So, okay, if you consciously open for a while to benevolent higher spirit beings, you can do it to do work, to do and so on and so on, but you have to deal with your own I. The dark spirits do not obey that law. 
they can force their way in. They can take possession of you and use you, for example, in murder, in voices in the head, in rape, in uh, criminality, and so on, and so on. Uh, yeah. Uh, they are sort of, they have separated themselves from the law. They are sort of spiritual criminals. So that question, what you pose, is actually not real because the benevolent spirits don't do it. Hmm. Like they don't come in? Not like the other. No, they don't come in because we are supposed to develop our eye. Hmm. We are supposed by the divine plan to work ourselves into the spiritual world through our eye. Hmm. In my opinion. <laughs> right, right. So then if I'm so if I'm in a psychedelic experience and I have the, you know, I have in, uh, the vision of an entity and it wants to get in or it's trying to get into me, that is an immediate like um signal that it is a benevolent spirit. Yes. And so then what do I do about that? Then if you can strengthen your eye in that moment then it can't get in hmm. and then I have what... done I have done that several times hmm. that is how I protect myself hmm. and then what do and then what if they do get in then what do I do about it oops then you have a problem <laughs> then you have a problem then you have to need probably need some help I have several people who come here with, which have that problem. Actually, this first coming Monday, a man come from America to get help from that problem. He has, he was possessed. He know it himself. He struggles with it, all these thoughts. And I have several times, if you can transform. And you see, in the beginning, in my early days, I translocated these spirits. Get them out. And now I realize that that was wrong. I have done actually very much wrong. Mm. Because where do they go? They go to others. And I don't want to... I have seen, for example, I, a woman come with a cystitis. I get this spirit out. She is happy, pay, pay me for the treatment. And then three weeks later, her husband gets down with the prostatitis. Mm. The same spirit. So, and he, th they don't see the connection, of course. But when I mention it, very many have observed this. Very many have observed it. Yes, that's true. When I got cured, my husband got that, or my child got that, or the dog got that. One woman said, I had a dog and it died in cancer. And I got another dog and it died in cancer. I got a third dog, it died in cancer. And I said, I, I cannot have any more dogs. I get devastated. And then I got cancer. Hmm. Uh, so, so actually, people with common sense, they see this. So, um, oh, where now, what was it the question? Now I'm talking I about getting, getting rid of the uh, possession. Yes, yeah. yes. You, you can translocate it or you can transform it. And if, then, and if we are possessed, then... Then we need help. I guess you would difficult to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. You can, if you can strengthen your I am and put it where the demon is, then you maybe can do it. Hmm. I think it is it is possible, definitely, but hmm. it is not necessarily easy. Hmm. So to like I, I like the, right there again, as you can as you already know, that's that's another hour discussion. Maybe if I if I, we just kept asking questions about what that would be like. Um, yeah. So we'll save that maybe for a future uh, uh, next opportunity. And I'll ask you this final question, which is kind of a compound question, um, but I feel like it's important, um, which is, I imagine that people who think you're full of shit probably aren't still listening. Um, <laughs> although, although if they are, 
have made it all the way to the end, there might be a variety of thoughts. There might be someone like, oh, finally, you know, somebody's saying it. You know, finally, James has someone on the show that's representing this. Thank goodness, you know. But there's could be some people like, I think more than you think. Think that <laughs> you know, I you know, I wouldn't actually be surprised. I think there is sort of like a, a secret shame cult of, of entity believers in the psychedelic yeah. culture, uh, not wanting to admit it because it's it's like cliche or something. Um, but there might be people who are like, okay, I listen to this and it still sounds like bullshit to me. Um, or maybe people who are like, okay, so what if it is real? You know, like, what does it even matter? And I couldn't know for sure anyway. So why even bother thinking about it? Like, what is sort of like, I'm asking a bit for like closing remarks for people who have heard this and in their mind, they go, why does it even matter for me to even think about this? If I can't prove that it's true and my immediate inclination is to write it off. Well, my, when you pose that question, my first thought was a program I saw from, uh, from Japan. Many Japanese men now prefer, uh, a uh, virtual girlfriend. What on earth they do with this girlfriend? I have no idea, but they actually prefer a virtual, virtual girlfriend hmm. on the net. You, you probably know this. Yeah, I've heard of it. They don't, they don't want a real girlfriend. They want a virtual. And they say, what is the difference? Maybe they actually say that, but I consider them far away from reality if they actually say that question. And that is also with these things. You can say, what if it's just in my head or what if it's real? To me, it is quite obvious. I have been a seeker of truth my whole life. I want to know the truth. And I want to develop my experience of the truth and my understanding of the truth. And that is why. If we want to just stay in some sort of bliss okay but if you that was actually a question uh, in uh, the film the matrix uh, this uh, guy who who betrayed neo said yeah i know this beef doesn't exist but okay i want it <laughs> so i i don't care for reality i want this so he said he, he, he actually answered your question. Hmm. Some may say that is okay, but the others, like uh, what was the leader, not Neo, but uh, Morpheus, mm -hmm. he said, of course, we need to get into reality, even if that reality was a shitty reality, <laughs> living in that under, underground city. It was not really nice at all. <laughs> But still, they wanted reality. And that is what my answer. If the spiritual world is reality, if these things are, a, are reality, it's important to get into that reality, learn to know it, and then you see you can develop. If it's just a fiction, you can never develop in that. Mm. All right, well, our... I don't think I said it right, but I gave it my best. Arr. Arr. Good. I think that's the best one yet. Uh, yes. Thank you very much for being on the show. Um, how can the listeners find out more about you? Um, do you have social media? If so, what are the handles? And you have written several books. Where can the listeners go to get those books? And which one would you recommend as a good launching point after listening to this interview? I guess the book called Demons and Healing, published on Temple Lodge. Uh, and there is a book called Spiritual Medicine that is on Amazon. And also a book, yeah, there are several. I have about 15, I think. But you find them on either Amazon or Temple Lodge. Amazon.com. Mm -hmm. and, your, and your social media? No, I don't actually. I have a Facebook page, but I I look at it every once a week, so I don't actually have a social media. Right. Okay. So your your books are the way to go for people. I'll be yes. sure to include links 
to uh, to the specific books that you mentioned, as well as your author page on Amazon and on, and on Temple Lodge uh, in the show notes of this episode, which are always available at jameswjesso.com. Ar, thank you very much for being on the show again, and I look forward to speaking again in the future sometime. Thank you. Looking forward to that too. And cut. All right. There it is. Cut. <laughs> yes, yeah. there it is. <laughs> Okay, so the larger context around this episode. Now, the thing is, is that, wow, again, it's just, like I said in the beginning, I'm still trying to grapple my head around this um, without falling into taking too hard a stance in any direction. But the first interview was basically destroyed by stupid choices that I never make these mistakes with podcasts. And it essentially destroyed the interview. Um, and as you mentioned, the, as I mentioned in the beginning, there was a mention that Tobias had claimed that it was demonic entities. And, you know, after this interview was recorded, Ar sent us an email saying that he had been contacted by a spirit saying he shouldn't have said the things that he said in this interview. And that uh, after that, my it's like crazy things started happening in my life that were like really, you know, like quite threatening i'm not at liberty or caring to share in a public forum but like really caused me to feel very very threatened and like and i you know i couldn't help but wonder about these demonic forces and so on and so forth and and honestly i was starting to wonder like if it's true if it's not if i should even put this interview out at all and then everything you know went down with tobias and and things just got crazy and then i then I have decided, you know, I spoke to R and he said, you know, believe it or not, but if it's true, you know, imagine it like you've got info on the mob. The best thing you can do is release that information because once the information's out, you're no longer a danger to them. So true or not, the interview is now out and you got to hear it. But I'm kind of washing my hands and stepping back because it got way too weird for me once I got involved with all of this content. And I'm trying to keep a pretty stable hold on my, you know, current reality as best as possible. So I'm going to probably step back a bit. But yeah, the larger context around this is, is very weird. Um, I'm going to be making a public statement slash video talking about what happened with Tobias once I get enough information from the people around him, because it's a really important thing, I think, for us as a community and a culture to be talking about and to know about because um, it's it's really a tragedy. Yeah, okay. Uh, again, I thank you for forgiving me for being really scattered in this intro and outro. Like I said, like I'm grappling with a lot of stuff right now um, and just making sense of it all. So, or at least doing my best. My sense making processes are running steady, although they are coming against some difficult computations. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Please support the podcast, jameswjesso.com forward slash support. Uh, you can become my patron. Very much appreciate that. PayPal donations, stuff from the shop, jamesabjesso.com forward slash shop. Buy some stuff, buy my books. Um, and again, this episode was dedicated to Tobias Tone. Um, Tobias, rest in peace, man. Okay, take care. <laughs>